product. So what we're going to do today is focus a little bit on how do you use it when I have that situation with multiple languages and I'm collecting feedback. What are the best practices to bring together? So Soft Landis and Shane Axel will be taking you through that process. How's everybody doing? Good? Not too tired after all the food? A little anxious to maybe get out of the pool? Alright, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, foreign languages or other languages and how we might be able to use those with the Clarebridge product. Um, slide here with some foreign languages on it so we can get the feel of it. Um, the first thing I wanted to say was uh, I, I came across this story which I thought was a fairly illustrative, so I want to tell a little story. Uh, about a woman who's traveling, and uh, in this country there's a this famous butcher shop, and it's uh, totally got the, the best cuts of meat, and she was very excited to try that out, and she goes into the butcher shop, and uh, in her best French, she says to the butcher, you know, hey, I've heard the stories about how great things are here, and uh, I'd really like to try, you know, one of the steaks that you guys have here, and uh, the butcher looks at her and just shrugs. She thinks for a second, but then luckily she pulls out of her pocket, she's tries the same thing in Spanish, and she says, uh, look, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not from around here, but I have heard that you guys have the best steaks, and I, I want to get a cut of the steak that you guys have here. Again, Butcher shrugs, looks at her, she thinks for a second. Luckily, she also speaks Russian. She tries it again in Russian, and again, the Butcher shrugs. So a little bit defeated, she turns and walks out. The assistant the Butcher walks up to the Butcher and says, um, maybe we should learn some other languages. Which looks at him and says, I don't know, that lady spoke like four. What did it do for her? <laughs> but obviously, the thing to take away from that is we don't want you guys to lose out because your customers are willing to speak to you just because you can't get what they're, what they're saying. And Clarebridge offers a lot of ways that you can maximize the places that you can listen to the voice of the customer or listen to data in other languages. <clears throat> uh, as we talk about languages, Clarebridge uses language packs um, to support different languages. Um, and those are made up of two parts. The NLP, um, the Natural Language Processor, I think that's where that word or phrase passed around, and out-of-the-box sound. Um, so when we use the word language pack, we're just talking about those two things. We support all languages. We just happen to have resources called language packs for some languages. Um, and in choosing those languages, it's important to pick the right ones. Does anybody know the six UN languages? Anybody to shout out? I'll give you a hint. English is one of them. <laughs> Spanish, yeah. French. 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 Russian. German. German is not. Sorry? Good call, but it is not. We're looking for two more. They are Chinese. Arabic. Um, if we expanded that to uh, languages spoken by over 100 million people, considered to be world languages, we'd get to put Portuguese in there. So extra credit for whoever said Portuguese. That is definitely a big language. And if we look at the languages that uh, we have language facts for, sorry, Ridge, <clears throat> you'll see that we support five of the six UN languages and six of the seven major world languages. We have uh, Italian, Dutch, and Japanese coming later this year. Um, so we're really expanding the number of places, the number of ways that you can listen. Is anybody right now using ClearBridge and able to uh, get data or have a uh, voice speak to them in something other than English? Anybody? Yeah? What languages? Um, a couple. Japanese, Russian, French, German. Japanese, Russian, German. Anybody else? Fine. Spanish? And what are you guys doing to listen to those? Do you have something in place right now, or do you have some way to, to process any of that? Are you guys doing anything with it? I'm sorry? Trying to develop, Trying to develop something. All right. Well, that's great. And what we're going to do uh, today is talk about uh, some procedures that you can use to hopefully capture that and uh, be able to analyze language data, even if you don't have language resources in your analytics team. So we're going to go through first configuring a project and set that up. Look at how we build out the models. Um, I have listen and analyze, but after the keynote speech this morning, I probably should have called it detect and analyze, right? 
Um, then we'll talk about what do we do for language support if we don't have a language event, how do we handle that? And then we'll leave some time at the end for questions. So if you guys can hold your questions to the end, we'll try and get to all the questions then. <coughs> Where do we start? Well, if you've got a project already going, you're all set. You've got the project, no problem. Or you can create a new one. In either case, two things you want to check on. You want to make sure that your sources are in a compatible format, and you want to make sure that you've got auto-detect languages on. Probably right now you're mostly set up to process in English. Auto-detection will detect which language for each verbatim, and be able to use the proper NLP package to process that data. And that's all you're going to do. This we have up here right now is sort of a model of what we think most uh, implementations of Clarivage look like. You've got your customers speaking in one language. You've got uh, an analysis group taking that language, using the tool to produce insights, and then feeding that to the proper team to take action. Um, but as we've just noted, there's a few more options out there. How do we handle those? Well, if you've already got a project going, it's going to be pretty much the same, the same process. You're still going to have an analysis team, and you're going to work with the primary model that you've already spent time building out. You don't have to invest new time for that. But we will take that and translate that into the other languages that you want to be able to process. And that translation can be done in a number of ways. Once you have those in place, um, you'll be able to roll those up into a single aggregation and be able to run your reports, see all of the insights through that rolled up model in whatever language you want to process. Now, if you have language proficiency, you can certainly maintain that language proficiency in the analysis, and you'll even be able to then have your analysis team speak to, I don't know, your satellite office that speaks another language than the main language directly with those insights, and they can communicate in that language. They can probably also uh, look for more particular things rather than whatever you're looking for in your main, uh, your main language. You can use a combination of these, some translated, some with language proficiencies, all one way or the other. It doesn't matter. And the process that we work from is to start by creating a model in your primary language, which if you're already using the implementation of Fairbridge, you probably have done. And the next step is to build out the additional language models. This is not the same level of effort. You've already spent the time to build the structure, know what categories and other things you're looking for. It's just the effort to translate the keywords rules into the target language. Then we'll set up a multi-language multi listening post. That's just the roll up the, the category model that will aggregate all of those different languages together so we can report on them as a unit. And then finally, we'll go ahead and report and act on those things. And as we continue the cycle, we can revise or edit those models as we need to in time. Maybe there's some new piece of data we take a look at that in the product. So what I've got here is some, uh, some data on the Summer Olympics. And I built this model exactly as we do for every other month. I use theme detection, a new, product, a new uh, feature in 5.0, but I also used all of the same tactics and uh, strategies that you normally are aware of, looking for the own words, looking for things that uh, are going to make sense to, to report on. Um, you can see our rules are written in English, just regular set of rules. And that first yellow lane there, table that is in um, And that's probably something that you've already done. The next step is our building out of the additional models. What I've done here in this project is build them out for Chinese and Spanish. So here's the exact same structure of the model. You can see I've got the same node names, the same category names, games, table tennis. Um, but what I've done is translate the rule. What I've done is taken each word, table tennis, ping pong, translated them, and brought them back into this rule. Um, I can use the same linguistic connections. So I have uh, table tennis serve or ping pong racket. Phrase, I can use those to cool. I've got the same thing for Spanish. So 
the exact same structure. I've just translated them into Spanish. <clears throat> The next thing is to set up that multi-listening or multi-language listening post. Like I said, it's uh, just a matter of aggregating all that data. What that looks like is another model with the exact same structure, games, table tennis. But rather than translate a rule, I've used the category reference feature to reference the table tennis category in each of those language models. Now when I use this model report on, I'll have table tennis from Spanish, table tennis from Chinese, table tennis from English. And the next thing is to report NACA on that. So if we go up to the dashboard, you can see that we can report on the aggregate data as well as the language specific data. On the right hand side, you can see I've got the Chinese and a Spanish word cloud. So I can report distinctly on those if I have the ability to read them. Anybody read Chinese? Spanish? Bottom one down there, I guess, right? um, And the pie graph you see is just a breakdown of how much in each language has gone into this project. Um, in the top left, I have the aggregated data. And I can still drill into it and do all the same things that I would normally do. So looking into the games category, I can see the breakdown. And when I see table tennis, and I think, wow, it's got a very high sentiment. I didn't think people were that excited about tennis. Table tennis. We can look in there and do an attribute report based on the language. And I can see, in fact, the Chinese are very excited about table tennis, more so than English speakers or Spanish speakers. Um, did a little checking after that. Anybody know what the percentage of medals that go to the Chinese in table tennis is? In the last six years, they've won 80% of all the medals in table tennis. I'm not surprised that you don't know. My data here says that your English speakers are not terribly interested in it. So. <clears throat> uh, and so now we can use all of this information in a language specific or in the aggregate to do all the same activities that we can do for what you're doing already. What do we do if we want to work with something that's not got a language back, a language that has a language back? Shane's going to talk about that. So, as it turns out, if you, if you need to work with voice of the customer in a language for which we don't have a language back, the process at a high level is pretty much the same, but there are some important differences that I want to talk about in the next few minutes. So, for this demo, I, I, I will be talking about Polish, if you want to talk about other languages like Thai or any number of other languages that, that we currently don't, don't, don't have language facts for, the same would apply to them. As I said, at a high level, the process is exactly the same, but when you get to the part about building out a model, there are some key differences, and that's where the differences uh, lie for, for uh, a language pack for processing a specific language. As an example, extra sentiment tuning will be necessary because we don't have out-of-the-box sentiment resources for these other languages. I'm going to talk more specifically about that in just a second. So what are the differences specifically? Here's a table breakout of what it looks like. In, in ClaraBridge, we do categorization, sentiment, and reporting on all of that. And if we have a language pack for a specific language, that all works nicely and as normal. For languages that are without a language pack in ClaraBridge, some things are different. For example, at the categorization level, we don't have linguistic relationships available for category rules. Now, a, a linguistic relationship is basically a relationship between words in any given sentence where uh, those are available in category rules in, in, in the, and they're derived from the NLP. And since the NLP, the NLP is not available without a language pack, those aren't going to be available in a category rule. At the sentiment level, the out-of-the-box sentiment resources are, are not available either. and so. It will take, so the sentiment tuning uh, requires extra tuning in order to get it up to speed with the other languages. Now, with every language pack, we provide uh, out of the box dictionaries. And those dictionaries take various words and they put them together, various terms to create 
terms that, that are important to, to help the NLP engine later on. Those out of the box dictionaries will not be available without a language pack. However, when you are developing custom dictionaries, that functionality is just the same. So, for example, if you need to, you, you can list all of your product lines, all of your domain specific terms, uh, your company names, for that, those all can go into a custom dictionary, and that process is just the same as, as, as with the language pack. And when we get to reports and reporting on all of this data, all this multi lingual data, the reports are exactly the same. Once I've got categorization set up, and once I have sentiment tuned correctly, then the reports just simply take that information, they aggregate it up so that I can start diving into the data, slicing and dicing, and doing some root cause analysis. So the, so the reports are exactly the same with or without a language pack. So I'd like to demo this Polish data for you. What I've done is taken some Polish Summer Olympics data and categorized it. So the first step, as Stop discussed, was taking an English, your English category tree and translating it into Polish. And we'll notice down here I've got the Polish, uh, the English rule translated into Polish. And you'll also notice that there are no linguistic relationships there because we don't have those available for Polish. And then, once I've got that all set up, and got that all translated, I, I move over to the sentiment and start tuning the sentiment. At this level, you'll notice that the sentiment words are all tuned to neutral. That's because we don't have out of the box sentiment words available to you. So that's where the, where the extra tuning comes in. You can, you can do this. The process is exactly the same. You read words, you decide what the positivity and negativity is relative to those words, and you tune it to what is necessary, and then, and then you move on. That is, that, that does, the process doesn't change, but the, the out-of-the-box resources are not there, so the jump start uh, takes uh, a little bit more tuning. So, in addition, in 5.0 of the software, we've provided the ability to create lots of uh, sentiment exception rules. And the sentiment exception rules take into account your word tuning, but as everybody knows, in context, the words change based on that context. Sometimes they're flipped, and sometimes they go from positive to negative, sometimes they decrement and increment. And that's all available in every language. But the, the out of the box exception rules are not available when I, when I don't have a language pack. So, one way to, to, to jump start this process is to take all of the exception rules that you already have in the other languages, translate those into the new language, for example, in Polish, and that's a way to jump start it. So, once I've got the categorization and sentiment set up, I, I failed is that uh, when I got the category model set up, my master model will have the references to, to include my Polish language category take uh, uh, tree. Now, so that so this Polish data will be aggregated up into the master category tree, and I can start using it to, to dive more deeply into this data. So this process. is, um, the, as I said, just, just to sum up, the, the process at a high level is exactly the same. At a lower level, there's at least a, a few differences that, that require a little bit more uh, tuning and some more attention. So, Stop and I, in, in today's in this session, we've discussed figuring a project in a multi-language environment. We said to make sure that your auto-detection is turned on and to make sure your sources are compatible. And when we go to build out the models, maybe we want to use our main language first, for example, English, and then translate into other languages. As we listen and analyze, uh, we'll use a master category tree that will have references to the other language trees, and we'll use language filters to, to be able to dive more deeply into each, into each of the languages. And then when I'm dealing with a language that we don't have a language pack for, there Pretty, everything is pretty much, everything is possible, and at a high level, the process is the same, 
and but there are some things that require a little bit more tuning. So we now have some time to take some questions. Yes. Could you tell me how the process of translating a model occurs? For example, if you um, you had a colloquialism like the word ping pong in there, or how um, as in the first question, and then how would um, how would a linguistic connection be translated between the two languages? Even though it would be consistent, how does that occur? So. So with translation, you want to be, uh, translation is always, you want to be careful with that. So we'll, let's start with the linguistic connection. Uh, the, the, it will not be a one-to-one -one crossover. That, that's a language-specific um, uh, issue. The linguistic connections from, for example, you know, if you're dealing with French to Portuguese, and this, that's where you want to, say your main language is English, and you want to go into French or something like that. Uh, you want to make sure that, that you understand what the linguistic relationship is, <coughs> is for French and use that one. It's more, um, I don't have a really fantastic term for it other than you know, localization is one, but that's a, another term that gets you know, used in lots of different forms. You just want to make sure you've got the equivalent uh, relationship in the language that you do in English. So when the model is translated, that's not going to be translated automatically, correct? Well, for, that's, that's correct. It's not going to be translated automatically. That's something that you have to work through. If you have somebody with language proficiency in your team, you can have them work on the translation. Um, I did these, I don't speak Chinese or Spanish, and I did my translations with an online tool. Okay, so the model isn't translated, it has the translation. That's correct. You would have to go through and change them in each of them. Although it, it's possible that the change might only be worthy in one language and not necessary in others. Um, when I translated the, uh, the, the ta table tennis into uh, Chinese, uh, I put in table tennis and I got some Chinese characters. Then I put in ping pong, I got the same characters back. Apparently there's not the same sort of two words that mean table tennis in Chinese. So if ping pong somehow changed in English, it wouldn't necessarily have to go and change that in Chinese. But you're, yes, if you were adding to it, you'd, have to, you'd want to do it all the way across and you'd want to get exactly done on that. Also, as part of the process, you'll want to uh, revisit models as needed. And, and it's a good, you know, it's, there's not an exact science to that. There's a, there are good rules of thumb. But when you, when you make one more robust, like for example, if English is your main model, you make that one a little bit more robust whatever kind of rotation. You want to add the other languages into that to, to make sure they're more robust as well. So, so you know, you need, you'll, you'll revisit as needed, and then you'll add these others as well. Uh, 
I'd love to discuss that with y'all. <laughs> you can also um, take some time to look at the model and see that the things are making some some sense to you. You're getting something that, you know, uh, in Japanese culture, maybe you never say anything bad unless it's really, really bad. So all of a sudden, you've got none, nothing that's coming out negative because no one's really ever saying anything negative. You have to know that uh, the things that are coming out and something, I don't know, you look at that and find that there's nothing negative. You can do that sort of work even without speaking because you can go ahead and report on these and then find some anomalous uh, data in the, in the report. When I was putting together the Chinese one, uh, I did the translation of Summer Games for the Summer Olympics, and Summer came out as a warming qi, which is in traditional Chinese medicine, and Games got translated into something more like activity, and uh, I started getting all this information on how to like cure my acne with like different, I don't know, exercises to keep my qi up. But I could see that immediately because I, when I did pain detection or something like that, I would then take some of the pieces back and look at the translations of those, and I would say, why am I getting something on acne? Why is that coming up? And I would see that anomaly and be able to say, all right, I need somebody who can tell me what's going on here. Uh, your language packs, are they tuned to a particular country, or are they just sort of generic? You need to speak English, you know, Canadian versus UK versus US. Yeah. So, so we try to be, we try to be, um, I think the right word, I don't want to misunderstand. We, we, we um, try to be as general as possible with each of the language packs. Now, the reason we have a, a UI to be tuning is because we understand that things change regionally. So, uh, you know, one thing that'll work in Mexico won't work in Colombia, for example. So that's why we need to do some tuning with each one. And, you know, that, that, that's a macrocosm of a microcosm that drove the reason we, we put the UI in there. You know, one company wants it tuned one way, and another company wants things tuned a different way. So this is just a, a larger scale, you know, regional, macro reason for, for the micro stuff that we put in there. So uh, we try to be as general as possible, um, but um, the, the UI is there to be able to tune uh, the regional differences. And it, you know, when you build out dictionaries, for example, each language will have different colloquialisms that they use that are that, that weren't that, that aren't generally used and those can be placed in, in those resources. So like the French dictionary or the English dictionary they just have like French Canadians or Canadian ones. French Canadian versus France France dictionary is in place too or we didn't we didn't take that into account per se. Yeah. Um, uh, pr primarily because we didn't I mean we didn't know exactly how many you know Canadian French speakers there were and you know would that be France is a good place to locate your French language pack, and it's a good general place to start. But it, 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 it's not as it's not. Uh, here, here's a good example: words change regionally more so than grammar does. So the grammar in the language pack is perfectly fine for French Canadian or uh, Canadian French, uh, but the words will need to be dealt with. Back there and then up here. All right, I'm, I'm guessing you don't have a translation tool built within, the, within like Nav Navigator, um, where let's say I'm previewing a sentence in Chinese. Um, you don't have I'm a way. Have, I'm, gonna have, I'm gonna have no way of knowing what it means. Um, could I have translate buttons and translate it for me so I can see if it's accurate, if it's gonna categorize accurately here. Right, we, we don't have a built in the UI no. Um, but uh, given that a lot of companies are going multinational, I would bet that you have somebody you go to for translation. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah. Just to build this out on the point, um, is there the ability to kind of have two different versions of a language pack? So in other words, American English, make a copy of it, and then dial the second version in for UK English. Presumably your auto detect would figure out that. Okay, we're talking about English here, but for other metadata, you might know the geography, where it came from. So can you apply you know, English version 2 for the UK and English version 1 for the US? I mean, there, there are definitely ways of doing that. So you could, you know, you can, uh, you know, the one that comes to, there are probably better ways, but the one that comes to the top of my mind is that we create different separate projects for them and put them in different 
projects. And we can also, you know, you can always have separate uh, dictionary resources for different um, for different projects and things that you use. But yeah, that's, that's that's it. What percentage of uh, your total feedback um, in specific language would merit implementing one of these alternative things? Because it looks like it's a piece of work just because of the whole translation factor and the model and the maintenance. So I would imagine that there's a threshold above which it's worthwhile investing in that extra work. What have you seen that other customers have used as that threshold? So I think some of the, um, we have a number of projects that get additional language data, especially with social media, we've seen that come in. Um, part of it is also you want to be prepared if new uh, other languages are coming in. If I'm set up for it, I'm ready, that begins to increase. So it may not be specific to how much I have already, but how much I expect to get. Um, and that definitely have to be something that you weighed out in the end. I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a clear line of how to set that up. I, I, won't, I won't say it's 1% or 5% or 8% of your data in a particular language. We have a couple of different, I mean, models are some folks have lots of English data and they've got 2% of the data in, I don't know, particular language, I mean, that's the Spanish. And, and they've just been ignoring the Spanish. But then all of a sudden it starts to pick up in volume and they want to pay attention to it. But, that's a relative, that's a relative uh, threshold that you have to set um, and decide, you know, are they doing business in, in uh, Puerto Rico or, or something like that? It, it, it's a relative decision. Um, I have two questions about languages that have no language pack. So first, I was wondering, does auto-detect language work on the text, or do you need to have structured or metadata available to filter for those while you're tuning them? So it'll, the other detect will detect that it is a language for which we have the language back. Okay. Um, so you're better off having structured data if you want to isolate, to just see your foolish and work on that. Uh, you can, yeah, so if, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna be bringing something in another language that you don't have the language back, if you have the structured data, you can certainly use that to filter with. Mm -hmm. um, if you're getting only foolish and then everything else is a language back, you'll be able to pull up everything that's processed with the, the language back. Right. Other, so also, I was wondering, since um, the, the in the categories you don't have the ability to have linguistic connections, would you say that it's fair that there's less recall in the data using these languages? Uh, I think that you have greater recall. Greater recall. So you'll um, capture more. Well. Um, Maybe I'm saying. Um, I guess what's the difference then that you can expect in your results in a language that has a language pack versus doesn't? Because it seems like you can get pretty far with doing a lot of the work manually, but you know, instead of having a language pack, but there is a still a differentiation between the two. So, so uh, a linguistic connection will uh, help get you to uh, increase, uh, for example, precision. Mm -hmm. So, so. You know, I, I want I want to think about it. Maybe okay. it off right now, but I would, I would expect the recall to go up if, okay. if I so so if you if you're trying to be specific about data, then a linguistic connection is a better way to go. Uh, if you're trying to capture a certain type of uh, relationship inside of a sentence, mm -hmm. right? And, and, um, so you might miss some of those cases. You don't have that linguistic. It's more yeah. likely that you'll catch, you can use two of the words in the link. Right. So the relationship, you'll catch everything, but you'll catch some I additional. Just it out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So, do um, most customers, or do you recommend, um, if you have, um, let's say, survey results in <coughs> Yep. But that's the that's the model that we set up here, and then you have a master model that looks at each one of those um, and gets you gets you an aggregate picture of what's going on in all of the languages. I think you had mentioned that there was a difference in grammar um, from language to language. How does this work for the non-language pack languages and the difference in how grammar is used? So is it based on 
So, so, so if we, so the way, so if we do auto detection, for example, the auto detection looks at the actual text and says, I have such and such a language on my hands, or I don't know what language this is. Let me send it to um, what, what we call in the covers the unknown language, and that doesn't have any grammatical support at all. So you're you're, you're not going to have, you know, you'll have a separation of words, but you won't have a grammatical. Nothing grammatically done. The grammatical stuff is done for, for linguistic connections and things like that. So you won't, that's why you won't have those available because it won't have been run. Thank you very much, James and Scott. So just a couple of logistics notes. The next the next session will be breakout sessions as well. So in this room, uh, Unilever will be presenting the voice of the employee. And next door is text mining as a shortcut to key moments of truth by Sage. So there's about a five minute transition here. You can decide which session you prefer to watch. Thank you.